My first question is, what do you think that your grandmother will think or have to say uh, about this work? Ah, I, I think she would be just as uh, surprised or even shocked as I was when I found her poems because, I mean, she always knew I was a musician since I was a child, so, so the musical part of it would not be a surprise to her. But the fact that I took so much interest and really took this into my heart and tried to uh, make it into a form that would be possible what that would make it possible to share with other people and uh, so so that's why I leaned on my musical background because I thought that would reach the greatest amount of people in its various you know <laughs> forms of, of music so so uh, the music itself I, I I think she would be completely uh, shocked that I have uh, taken this so deeply and uh, admire her work so much that I would want to spend basically three years of my life trying to bring this to life. <laughs> I think so because we had a very different type of relationship. You know, she was a grandmother, I was a kid, and I knew her as someone very, very funny, uh, very lighthearted, uh, always. Uh, uh, just enjoying life. She played uh, tennis and then table tennis. She was always very social. She was, uh, my, my mom called her like our little social butterfly. She was a very uh, happy kind of laughing all the time kind of person. And uh, the one personal detail that's kind of funny about that is that she was a chain smoker, which <laughs> these days I guess would not appeal to a lot of people, but you know, she started uh, in uh, the 1920s when, uh, when for a lady with a cigarette it was, you know, Marlene Dietrich kind of uh, image, and it stuck with her till literally her last uh, days. And uh, so she would smoke two packs a day, other than other than when she was in a concentration camp, of course. That no, but after that, she did. And uh, despite of which she lived till the age of 86. So <laughs> I don't know how that was, but she was uh, really tough in that way clearly physically very strong root. Uh, so this kind of lighthearted person uh, that I knew was an avid reader. Reading was her big, big thing. She would be reading all the time. And uh, that's as far as I knew that her interests really in the arts went. So, so Never mind the fact that she actually created it herself, that, that I had absolutely no idea. And also uh, that she had that much uh, depth, frankly, because my mom considered her a little too lighthearted and a little superficial, perhaps. And uh, so to find the poems with the uh, level of contemplation that they that they have, uh, which is uh, anything but superficial, you know, there is a lot there. Uh, so that to me is uh, is uh, is a huge surprise on a personal level because that's not at all how I would have ever uh, guessed my grandmother was based on what I knew. Yeah. Wow. And did your mother know about this when you found this? This book she wrote, her notes, was your mother alive? Uh, no. And in fact, I found the booklets because my mother passed away. I mean, I would not be going digging her desk, you know, when she was alive. That would not be <laughs> appropriate. So only when she passed away, which was um, in 2016. And uh, it took me about a year to find the courage, frankly, to open her things and start rummaging through and see what's there in some attempt to eventually clean up things, which I still haven't been able to do, frankly. It's a really difficult job. I don't wish on anyone to have to go to your, through your uh, deceased parents. Things is very, very hard. So, so, uh, about a year after my mom passed, I was in her Prague apartment 
and I said, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's start with this. And I was in fact actually curious also because I knew there were some documents about their origins, you know, some uh, uh, birthday certificates and things like that. So I was curious to see how that was because I've never seen any of it. And so I was looking more for that, like documents. And uh, there I found these booklets and they were not very visible. I, they were tucked behind other things. And um, I don't know why I never knew about it other than I think it may be because my mom and grandmother did have a, uh, what these days you would call a complicated relationship. Uh, my my mom did whatever she could for her mom when uh, my grandmother was uh, older and uh, in somewhat poor health. Uh, but uh, in terms of admiration from one to the other, I, I don't know how much of that was there. And uh, I think my mom, who was also a writer, she, she was uh, trained as a journalist and she was a philosophy professor eventually as her job, uh, but she always wrote things and eventually she wrote her memoir, a lovely book called The Fortress of My Youth. And uh, as someone who writes and reads a lot, uh, you would think that reading these poems, she would have been able to appreciate that there is definitely a, even if not a personal then literary quality to these poems. And the fact that she dismissed it and just pushed it in the back tells me it was a personal, it was more of a personal rejection on her part, you know. Uh, and, and even she could have just taken them and given them to a Holocaust museum or something like that if she didn't want to deal with it. But uh, they were hidden. <laughs> so uh, so I, I read into that something, you know. I don't know if rightly or wrongly, but I think there's something there that was on a personal level, uh, not what my mom wanted to cherish about her own mother. Yeah. What about wow. So m maybe your mother did not even read the, the poems. Well, you know, we, we will never know that actually, <laughs> but it's, it's possible. Well, I, I would be surprised that she didn't because, uh, once you open it, it was so powerful. I don't know how anybody would not want to read it, you know, or at least go through it and read some of it. I'm sure she did. I'm sure she did and decided to do absolutely nothing with it. Um, yeah. But as I say, like the relationship was complicated and these poems were written in the concentration camp where my grandmother is between the age of 41 and 44. Four, and my mom is 14 to 17. Now, 14 to 17, those are not easy years for anyone uh, in relationship to their parents. Usually there may be some rebellion. There may be some lack of appreciation for the parents because uh, you are very critical of them and so on. So I believe that my mom uh, even maybe was embarrassed you know, now that I think of it, she could have been embarrassed because lots of these poems are love poems and uh, some of them are passionate and some of them are critical of the relationship with uh, my grandmother's husband, Richard. And, uh, and some of them are uh, borderline erotic. So if a kid would read this, they would be definitely embarrassed. And, and maybe after the war or whenever, Whenever my mom took uh, possession of these, which actually, now that I think of it, that makes more sense that it would have been after my grandmother passed away. I mean, she would have had those. And then when she passed away, which was in 1987, my mom had these for the next decades. And, and so she was actually mature when she read them. But regardless, maybe because it was about her parents and potentially even not parents, maybe there was a lover, you know, I did think maybe there's a lover there somewhere. Um, so that definitely my mom would not appreciate. <laughs> so uh, reading about her parents or her mom. So, so I think there was uh, a lot of, a uh, lot of uh, colors to this uh, whole thing and uh, which would probably explain why she decided to just ignore it. 
Wow, yeah. Well, while I was reading the text uh, accompanying your album and also the poems, I have to say that I was not able to, to avoid crying, uh, especially when reading about the, the, the loss of your uh, of grandfather, of his uh, her husband. Oh, yeah. uh, so uh, may, maybe it was also too sad for your mother to 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 let it go for yeah. a museum, or, or also to share it with nobody else because that was really disturbing uh, situation for them. Yeah. I mean, it, it something like that is so terribly strong and sad that wow, maybe I was not able to do anything with that, even myself, if I was wow. her. Hmm. what to do you don't want to lose it but you don't want to think about it maybe yeah, but as I you said know. we will never know we will never know but maybe your mother appreciated that or just read two two verses and she had to stop because it was too dramatic too dramatic and too deep and too painful i mean that's very possible i didn't actually think of it from this point of view but because i do know that the relationship there was a complicated one so i thought it might be more that but i think you could be absolutely right that it brought back pain and memories that she didn't want to really go back to that's very very possible i mean just as possible as my own interpretation of this yeah yeah well so as you said we will never know <laughs> but i have more questions and the next question is when they both were liberated yeah. uh, what did what did they do because you say your grandmother had a, she was living in czech republic right and your mother too in prague yeah uh, um, no, actually not in prague uh, my mom uh, by the time I was born, uh, or a little bit before that, she moved to Prague to go to university. But uh, they lived in small towns before that, for one and then the other. Uh, one called Josefov and another one called Mnichovo Hradiště, which are unpronounceable, so don't even try it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure of that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so they were small towns. And uh, before uh world war ii my grandfather had a successful business he was a winemaker he was uh distilling liqueurs and not only that also like juices for you know uh nectars and things like that so it was uh, uh that was the plant that where he worked and uh after the war when my grandmother and my mom came back in 1945 my grandmother who actually never worked on until then she was a very a spoiled lady a very as i said like very happy and all that but she was also very spoiled let's just say the way it was <laughs> she never worked uh, so uh, and i think very proudly somehow <laughs> she just made it a point <laughs> even with the communists there was another kind of a complaint from my mom against her own mother she said i don't know how this lady even under communism where everyone has to work it's illegal not to work uh the grandmother basically made it uh the mission of her life to <laughs> not to be working <laughs> and uh, so it's uh, it's uh, i mean i don't think it's quite so true back I, I i do remember uh that my grandmother, who also got away with everything, she was really a remarkable. Like she spoke languages very well. She spoke very good German, a little less French, and very, very little English. And yet she managed to have private students for all three languages. And it was really quite pathetic, but she got away with all those things. <laughs> Oh, really unbelievable very very self-confident clearly that she can do anything you know wow and i think that's really wonderful and so before the war she didn't work uh whereas richard her husband did and uh after the war when she came back she got back uh 45 to 90 1948 the country was still capitalist it was uh, the previous uh, regime was still in place 
So people that had businesses uh, got them back, let's say if they were Jewish and so on. So, so they would be returned the property. And uh, so she, my grandmother, as I said, being very self-confident, but uh, clearly very capable, uh, she took this uh, plant or factory to, to make the liqueurs and she made a go of it. She took a loan from a bank to restart and without any knowledge of either the particular business or any business experience, she had very good three successful uh, years of uh, production that she was doing and um, learned how to do all of those things very, very quickly and she was able to repay the loan like within months almost. So so that's what she did. But then, of course, in 1948, uh, the country's uh, regime changed to communism and uh, uh, that meant any business that had more than one person working there uh, would be uh, given to state. It was appropriated and uh, so she lost the the business as well as they lost again their house and all those things so so that's what happened but my grandmother you know managed very beautifully after that still as i mentioned already <laughs> whereas my mom uh, went uh, to first year she was back she caught up on her uh, secondary education because she lost all those years uh, of education and in one year they had some sort of a system where people that uh, came back from the camps uh, the few that did uh, could could recover the, the, the timeline a little bit so so her five years that she didn't have 1940 to 45 she was able to take all that education I think within one year so that she could continue then on and uh, uh, so that's what she did and she went to university in Prague and uh, uh, studied there whereas my grandmother stayed in one of these smaller towns and when did you move to Canada uh, I moved in the early 1980s and I came by myself. Uh, I lived actually already at that time. I was away from Prague and from uh, my mom. Uh, I lived in Denmark for a couple of years and uh, uh, went to university there. And then uh, I decided that I was going to... Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I actually love Scandinavia, so that's a little bit of a silly thing, but I, I wanted to be a singer, which I was a singer since I was a child, and and uh, I entered some competitions there for singing, you know, kind of like an idol <laughs> of the time, and, uh, um, and I was told that I shouldn't bother because I had an accent in Danish and that I would always have, it's a very difficult language actually, not to have an accent in just like Czech is. So uh, so that I would always have an accent and so I could only reach a certain level, but after that, you know, you're wasting your time, little girl, you know. So, so I just uh, applied to Canadian uh, landed immigrant status and moved from Denmark to Canada and there I went to school to continue and I worked on cruise lines and worked as a musician and did all sorts of very adventurous things until I met my husband and then uh, it became a more settled and stable but I had also or, already I've always kept on working as a musician yeah yeah and you so you have never returned to live in Czech Republic or Denmark. You go sometimes no. for visiting your family and so. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, 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 uh, well, by the time the regime changed in Czech Republic uh, from communist to democracy uh, in 1989, by the time I was very firmly, you know, established uh, uh, here in, uh, in Canada and I, uh, well, actually, I, I was just about to start having babies <laughs> and uh, I was married and uh, so, of course, that would not be right to just drop all this and go back yeah 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 of course yeah and about Canada I'd like to mention the financial assistance from the government especially to an album like this because you have a lot of composers many musicians 
So I think it is a very ambitious work in the financial terms. So uh, I think Canada is a good place for doing this kind of projects. How can you be, deal with this? Uh, because the budget has been very huge to make this work, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I have not dared to count it all up. <laughs> But I think, I think if I really just put some major numbers together, I would say it probably cost me $35,000, you know. So that's nothing to sneeze at. And that's with me doing pretty well everything. That's just hiring people, commissioning the works, and uh, then editing. And uh, I, I think most of the time was actually spent in the production uh, with, my, with my engineer, with whom I worked um, remotely online. We had uh, sessions uh, many evenings uh, throughout the last year and a half, if not two years, uh, where we were uh, w working together because I had very, very exact ideas how I wanted everything to sound. So people would send me their their tracks you know recorded in their own little studios or homes uh, because these days everybody has learned how to record at home which is not very good for the recording studios but <laughs> it's great for the artists and um so everybody was sending me these things but then i would mess with it you know <laughs> i would uh, and even the compositions that i got from other people that i commissioned i <clears throat> i uh, took I, I just chopped things up and threw it around and I, I, I yeah so I, I would say I spent most of my budget and and pretty well all of my time on the editing part of it and on the production yeah uh, but yes you're right I mean Canada is a great place for for uh, this type of project because you do get grants uh, it's not automatic of course you know you have to submit a very complicated grant applications and it's a, a difficult a difficult process but uh, if you are approved uh, the the government and can, uh, specifically the Ca Canada uh, Arts Council the Canadian Council for the Arts exactly is very generous with this and uh, so I have been lucky to get grants both from the uh, Canada Council for the Arts and Ontario Arts Council to help me with the budget because otherwise it would have been uh, well absolutely impossible I would have been able to do just maybe a small fraction of what I dreamt of doing so Canada is great for that I I, I think there's grants in other countries I hear let's say from my um, colleagues in Czech Republic and so on but uh, I have to say uh, lucky us here in Canada for this. So thank you to the institutions from Canada for this. And as I, we were talking about the um, commissioned uh, composers, you have, I think, six yes. other women composers, also one collaborator who is Genia, who made the video clip. How was the procedure of uh, the criteria for selecting the other composers? Well, that's because I knew their work uh, and I was looking, uh, I guess you figured that it's not coincidental that they're all women. Uh, I wanted women artists involved as much as possible and so all, all the compositions were written by women uh, because I felt my grandmother's work was very much work of a woman. I mean, it had all the, uh, all the what you would think a woman would, I, maybe it's categorizing in some wrong way these days, I don't know, but to me, it just spoke like a woman. I mean, it was very clear if you read any of it, this was written by a woman. So I felt that to honor it and give it the perfect voice, I needed also a woman composer. And uh, uh, I chose so many because because I wanted a variety of uh, approaches to the music and I'm really really happy that uh, I believe this has been accomplished uh, because there are so many uh, there's such a great range of expressions and the musical sensibilities because everyone of course brings to it their own uh, composition skills and uh, approaches and that's what I wanted I was really 
worried that if I just start doing it all by myself, it'll all sound the same, you know? And I, after three songs, everybody will just get tired of it and not listen. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, okay, to make this interesting for listeners, I need the wide range. And of course, everyone's strength is something different. You know, I have a, a friend uh, who's actually of Czech origin, like myself. Her name is Zita Petrak. Uh, she is a, a sort of avant-garde jazz uh, composer and a pianist. And so I knew giving it to her, this is going to take it in a completely different place than I would ever be able to do. <clears throat> because I frankly uh, can't access her music very easily, you know. But that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted something that will be uh, like something I never could write. And uh, the same thing, let's say, with... Um, uh, she, she wrote the, the song called uh, Koleda and, uh, or Trick or Treat in English. Uh, or there is one uh, by um, a friend and a colleague with whom I worked for a long time. Her name is Lori Wolf. And Lori is a percussionist. So giving it to her, I said, you know, go with your strengths. Just write this. If it's just percussion and just drums, I don't care. This would be great. It would be completely different than what I could do. And, and, and she actually wrote it for marimba and drums. And uh, that's, a, that's a track. Uh, uh, called Chasing Time, Je ne So uh, everyone's taken a different approach according to how they understand the words and the music. And then there is one uh, <clears throat> one person I definitely have to mention. Her name is Jessica Deutsch, uh, with whom I've collaborated also now for a number of projects. And uh, she's an amazing uh, string player, both uh, on all the string instruments, actually. <laughs> uh, violin, viola, cello, bassin. So, um, so she has a very chamber, like a classical chamber approach. So suddenly there are these songs that are like from some sort of a movie, you know, it sounds just so beautifully uh, I don't know how to describe it, but it sounds like chamber music. That's really what it is. So, so, so she wrote uh, two, three, I think, pieces on this. Uh, so again, you know, a completely different thing than what I could do. So, so that was the point: is to present all the range of this uh, women composers' um, talents here. Yeah, thank you also for that because this way I have learned about these people. Some of them, them I knew. I think only Mili Hanatkova, who she is settled in Czechia, right? I met her there in Ostrava. But the others, I was not aware of them. So now also me and the uh, readers can uh, make some research about them. I think this is the first video clip, right? Uh, from the piece, Kam Shme Sasli. For sure, it's not how to pronounce it. Um, this is a video make it make with sand. Uh, why did you choose this technique or this uh, artist? Uh, and why was this uh, the song the first in the album and the first video? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I because I'm 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 uh, yes. So it. Maybe it was a wrong choice, but I was very personally attached to this uh, because I, I just love both the poem. I mean, if, when I read uh, the 65 poems that there are, this one really jumped out at me. It really did. So, so it's one of the first that I knew for sure because the choices were actually difficult to make because there is, you know, half of them are wonderful and wanting to to be set to music uh, so it was a hard choice but this one was a very special one and uh, that i really appreciated how it's so positive uh, it says uh, we are in this very very bleak place and then it talks about that don't forget that even in the hardest of times remember the sun and so it gives that twist to the misery you know with a hopeful uh, thinking forward and then it talks about uh, love and appreciating love as the only uh, real core of, of our lives and and so on so i i really loved it and uh 
my daughter, uh, my daughter Rachel plays a beautiful classical piano and she has written some very nice melodies before. And I thought, you know, this would be really meaningful to me if uh, Rachel can uh, uh, <laughs> can set this one. And uh, so, so I asked her because I knew I was going to be asking a lot of various people, but I actually didn't ask her. I commissioned her. I hired her. Yes, I hired her. And uh, so she worked on it for a while and came up with this uh, really special melody. And uh, then I arranged it uh, and took it to where it is right now. And and it really is such a, a beautiful combination of uh, sad and hopeful. And so that is something that I see uh, represents the album very well. Uh, if if somebody would hear only one song, I think this one is the one that gives them uh, the, the the range of that, the the tragedy and the optimism at the same time. And uh, so that's why I chose it to be as the first. And I just happen to also love the music that <laughs> that was created for it. And uh, why I chose sand art uh, is because I only recently, maybe a couple years ago, came across this as an art form uh, that I saw in some uh, Yiddish contest that I was a part of. And uh, somebody had a video of sand art in it, and I just loved it. I just loved it. I thought this is the most beautiful thing, you know. Once again, it combines all these different things. It's a, it tells a story, but it's also very folky, you know. It apparently it's a folk art, and and uh, so I thought it's uh, this would be a very interesting way how to present this, uh, because I don't really want to make uh, these songs uh, videos where it's me singing somewhere it's just because i don't feel it's about me so i am very reluctant actually to be in the studio uh, in the <laughs> in the videos and uh, so um especially if it's not even my music so it's me singing but somebody else wrote the music somebody wrote the words so you know why me so i shouldn't be there so so that's why i am looking for different ways how to actually create videos that don't have me in it and uh, so so this seemed to be a perfect um, a perfect uh, combination of all the right things for me and when I came across this artist I looked her up and found her and asked her if she would do this it's a lady I do believe she is uh, actually from Ukraine uh, and lives in New York and she's a Yiddish singer her name is Zhenya Lopatnik and uh, and uh, I, I really liked her, like the minute we connected, I, I thought this is the perfect person, very, very sensitive. And uh, in fact, I asked her to create another sand art piece, which she did, which would be uh, once once Thieves of Dreams uh, become more like a stage production. Right now we have it in a beautiful form of concert. We have the album in a concert. It will also be a book. But but the original dream I had was actually a stage thing where you have uh, stories included and uh, a lot of visuals. And uh, so I thought one beautiful element of that could be one of the stories that is a very dramatic one in fact it's about my grandmother saving my uh, herself and my mom from transport to auschwitz so that story is very strong and i said how do i just stand there and tell the story it's not going to be it you know standing on stage uh so once again it's not even my story so <laughs> you know uh, i need to present it uh in a different way. So I have uh, <clears throat> commissioned Zhenya to create a sand art piece, but it's about five minutes long, where there would be reading a narrator. I found the narrator, beautiful voice, uh, and he's reading this dramatic story with the background that viewers uh, or the audience will see uh, on a big screen on stage with this and sand art as uh, illustrating the story so uh, it's to me is is a, it's a beautiful art form it, and it's just so physical in many ways right because you see the hands and you can see it's everything is done in real time you know it's just so special so so i i really enjoy working with that and this particular artist yeah and also it feels like it's temporary because yeah. uh, it's been done and it is destroyed immediately after to create yes. something else and i feel it is like very connected with the last uh, part of the poem 
of this song we are talking about, what is this place? It says, we're eternally lost and eternally redeemed. It's like, a, like the same uh, things you, you lose and you is re, re, take it, retaking again. That's and right. in the dark, in the darkest of nights, remember the sun. Yes, so it's like a very um, metaphoric also to use this technique of the sun and yes. constantly being destroyed and rebuilt. Rebuild. I, I, I think you've actually uh, hit the nail on the head with this one. That's exactly uh, <laughs> a very beautiful part of sand art that fits so perfectly with it. It's the fact that it's so impermanent. It's it's uh, here and then not there. And then the new thing happens. And it, it, it is, in fact, uh, uh, an important part of many of these poems is that they do, pay, do depict the fleeting moments of something. Usually, in my grandmother's case, it's love. She's talking about love was and isn't. That's in, in most of her love poems, this is the case. Uh, except for one, there's one called Miracles or uh, Togetherness, where, where in fact it's just, just describing a beautiful love and there is no loss at the end of that poem. So <laughs> it's one of the unique ones where there's nothing bad happens in the end. But all the other ones with all the beauty, you also see the end of it. And it's kind of wondering like what happened to that, you know? So. Yes, you're right. That's uh, the the sand art goes beautifully with that. Yeah, I have to tell you that I like the song, of course, and some of my favorites are um, "Run, Run, You Little Human." Oh yes, <laughs> that's yeah, <laughs> nice. And "My Paradise of Solitude." <laughs> also, I like those a lot. Uh, Thank you. Well, but the album is, as you said, is is uh, like very diverse. But of course, it's your voice, and you have made the addition and the mixing, and so so. At the same time, it feels like it is a um, whole. Yeah, it is something we say. It is something round. I mean, it's not just sketches of things, but it's something like it's yeah. uh, somehow connected and complete. Yeah. And I, I do find that that's because it's the same writer of the poems my grandmother's voice and then my physical voice the two are the permanent everything else is changing all the time but those two are enough to hold the whole thing together and uh yeah it's it's very special i spent a lot of time thinking about it how to make it a whole so it's not uh, so it's completely diverse and yet together so so it's not like these little blotches of nothing in between as you said you know it could be that if it was too many styles uh with no connecting tissue it it, it could be feeling a little disjointed or kind of like random you know yeah <clears throat> but i'm really happy that you like uh, uh utike the run uh, run run little human because that to me is uh like a really incredible poetry actually and and i i wasn't sure what to do with it until it just occurred to me but uh, but it's it's a very unique poem uh, uh, yeah so so i'm i'm very glad that you liked it and 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 in terms of uh, musical uh, treatment to it it uh, definitely qualifies as one of the craziest things i've ever written because <laughs> yeah, anybody knows anything about music you will see it's so not traditionally constructed the harmonic progression it's uh, what i wrote it kind of uh, intuitively because i wanted to be different and then i came back to it to actually record it about a year later and absolutely couldn't figure out what i was going what was going on in that song it was very difficult <laughs> to actually write it down because it was so just intuition and uh, difficult harmonic progressions that nobody can figure out <laughs> <laughs> congratulations <laughs> yes I have one more question. We are talking about that uh, most of the people involved in this are women, but uh, in the booklet there is a man that is a friend of the people from Music Before Shabbat, who is Daniel Rosenberg. What has been his his work in this in this project? Well, he has uh, come on board. Uh, when I already had the concept and all that 
pretty well figured out and the recordings for the most part also finished uh, or at least in their raw forms at least the compositions were done not all of it was recorded yet um, but he has put uh, brought in in fact he was uh, recommended to me by my manager Ian Menzies who's uh, who knows him and worked with him with Daniel before and uh, uh, I just knew Daniel's reputation as an extremely knowledgeable capable and wonderful uh, man <laughs> so uh, so I I when when Ian my manager mentioned his name I said oh yeah yes 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 I'm aware of Daniel and uh, we asked him or Ian actually asked him if he would be interested to uh, to work with me on this project and and Daniel was extremely enthusiastic like from the first moment uh, when he heard what is involved I think the intrigue of finding those poetry booklets really uh, really inspired him and he thought oh this is you know special this is unique let's let's do something with this so he was extremely helpful like right from the start and he has steered some uh, some important uh, parts of it, um, if not all, in fact, uh, by suggesting, for example, what I wanted to do originally was to put out a double album, which was uh, uh, the, all, everything in Czech and then the poems that are translated in English. And I wanted to make it like a double and he felt that that would be very complicated. It would not be possible to even presented or marketed in any way because one language another language is it Czech is it English is it what and I think he made a great point with that because I was already going full speed ahead with this awful album but he kind of stopped me and he said no 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 uh, this will be much better and so on so that was like right in the beginning uh, but right after that when when it was getting uh, more uh, when it was progressing the project he he is uh, instrumental in getting it to people uh, like yourself and everyone uh, I, I would even not know where to start so he is unbelievably important and helpful in this and his enthusiasm is really incredible too <laughs> he's such a positive person must be one of the most positive people I know <laughs> Yes, and you are also um, collaborating with him in the project of Silent Tears, The Last Yiddish Tango, yes. for which you make uh, at least one song and one video clip. Uh, yeah, there is actually another one I already recorded, uh, which is called Bitter Winter. Uh, yeah, these are very difficult songs. The first one was extremely, excruciatingly difficult uh, because it's somewhere between tears and screaming. <laughs> the whole thing is like I, I didn't know how to approach this it was just such a difficult material really really to emotionally you know how you say it so that you're not too uh, too involved or not enough you know it, you have to navigate uh, and the other one the bitter winter is also difficult but less so I mean the whole project of his uh, uh, silent tears Swedish tango is uh, very deep and, uh, and, and and painful actually um, collection of of, uh, of music so yeah. but I am very honored that he has included me in this because there's beautiful artists on this yeah yes yes uh, we also listened and saw the video in music before Shabazz on editions ago uh, your song is the one of the person who has been in the experiments of uh, Mengele, right? And yeah, I, I was crying like a, a quarter of an hour without the stop when I saw it. But this is really, really beautiful at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much, Lenka. Um, you know, we know you for many years in the distance. We have never been talking in real time. We have you played guys, your music in the radio I love show. It. It's a whole different thing seeing you face to face and actually talking. It's it's beautiful. I love yes. it. Yes. The next step is to meet in person, I hope, maybe in Toronto in the future. I would love to, to go back there. And thank you for the work, for the music, for this specific work also so meaningful. Uh, and as I told you, if you want to say anything else for the people who are watching and reading Missing View for Shabbat. I have one little thing to say. And that is, I've described in some uh, detail uh, the relationship between my mom and my grandmother. And I think it's very important 
<laughs> to say that since I started working on that, I think they have become united. <laughs> <laughs> and so I feel they are listening and they are supporting together. And uh, I think uh, because of working with it, with my mom's voice, with my grandmother's poetry and all that, they have actually become a very strong presence in my life, both of them. And so I feel like I have one and the other sitting on my shoulders. <laughs> and they are very friendly. <laughs> Because I may have portrayed them as, uh, you know, not so good together, but I think they're actually finally in peace and together, uh, together with me and my daughter, daughters, in fact. So, so it's really, uh, it's been very, very deep and uh, fulfilling to, 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 to do this because of those relationships. And uh, to say to your, uh, to your listeners, I am so appreciative of, uh, uh, giving time and space to this particular work of art, specifically of my grandmother and so many beautiful artists that are on this album. So I really appreciate the time that you give it and uh, uh, listen and so on. So it's, it's, it's wonderful and I thank you so much. Thanks from my side, really, Lenka, and keep on with this wonderful work you, you are doing. Yeah, it's really, really moving. And we will be in touch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.